Good evening. I'm Congresswoman Joyce Bailey, and welcome to tonight's third Congressional District Teletown Hall meeting. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us, and tonight I'm interested in hearing from you. Brand new this evening, we are streaming the Teletown Hall live and Facebook live where constituents will also have an opportunity to ask questions and link to the live stream can be found on my website or social media pages at www.facebook.com backslash Rep Bailey and www.twitter.com backslash Rep Bailey. Now, first, before we get it started, I'm gonna give you some instructions. There'll be plenty of time for you to ask questions on issues that matter to you. Throughout the call, if you have a comment or a question, please press zero to be assisted or leave a comment on Facebook. Also, please be aware that tonight's call is being recorded. The recording will be posted on my website www.baity.house.gov and YouTube page at www.youtube.com backslash Rep Beatty for individuals who were not able to participate this evening. As the Congresswoman for Ohio's 3rd Congressional District, please know that my staff and I are here to serve you. I have two offices, the Washington office, where I am tonight, right off of the United States House floor. I came here to speak to you tonight. I'm located at 133 Cannon House Office Building, the oldest office building on Capitol Hill. And the phone number is area code 202-225-4324. The district office is located at 471 East Broad Street in downtown Columbus, Ohio, and the phone number is 614-220-0003. I am joined tonight by my entire congressional staff. To those back in the district, thank you for joining us. Right here in my Washington office, the team is all on board to assist us tonight. And this time, we have an audience. Right here live with me is the Ohio State University Washington Academic Internship Program. And they're here to see firsthand the interworkings of Congress and the federal government. Also joining us, Live in the office here with me is Sam Berger, Senior Policy Advisor with the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. And on the phone line with us is Wendy Patton. She is the Senior Project Coordinator with Policy Matters Ohio, based out of Columbus, Ohio. You will hear from them throughout the call it's important for us to give accurate information. Thus, I have asked the experts to join us. Both of them are experts in the healthcare related field, so they will fill those questions along with me and my staff. Sam, both Sam and Wendy have done extensive research and they're extremely knowledgeable on the Affordable Care Act and the Republican Health Care Bill, the American Health Care Act, and they'll also address calls on Medicare and Medicaid. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Wendy, on the phone for joining us. Again, a few more instructions. If you have a comment or a question, please press zero or leave your comment on Facebook and my staff will assist you. I thought it might be interesting to give you a snapshot of what we've been doing in Congress to serve you. So since coming to Congress, we've done a lot. We actually have a chart that we call snapshots of our accomplishments. And we can share things with you like the number of bills that I've sponsored, 43. The number of bills that I have co-sponsored, 
824 bills. We have a strong constituent casework team. We have actually closed out 1,566 cases, and here's something that we're very proud of. We have returned to constituents $1.62 million. And constituent mail, we read your mail, we open the emails and the letters and the cards. Let me say thank you for that. And we have opened and read all 80,000 of those correspondence. I will go on to tell you that we are very proud of reviewing and writing grants and being someone to facilitate bringing dollars into our community. The Choice Neighborhood Grant received $225 million. Head Start Grants, $45 million. The Smart City Challenge Grant received that we were very engaged with that process with our city and with our Columbus Partnership, $40 million, and now they have it at more than $100 million. Last but not least, infant mortality. We're so proud of the $1.7 million provided for infant mortality. That is only a snapshot. Just a reminder, if you have a comment or a question, please press zero and my staff will assist you or leave a comment on Facebook. You can't be in Congress without doing legislative work. As a longtime advocate and champion to end human trafficking, I am so very proud that during the 114th Congress, my bipartisan legislation to combat child sex trafficking unanimously passed the Congress. It was so exciting to be on the House floor that day and watch all of those green lights light up. What a victory for those who had been engaged in child sex trafficking. President Obama signed that bill before he left office. I am a big proponent of education, so I'm so proud to share with you that I introduced legislation that passed that made the tax deduction for out-of-pocket expenses paid by elementary and secondary teachers for supplies and expenses permanent. That bill, the reimbursed educators who pay for academic year, called Repay Supplies <clears throat> Act, was also included in a bipartisan tax package, and it too was signed by President Obama before he left office. I am so proud because we have so many elementary and high schools in our district. Thank you to all those hardworking teachers from the 236 elementary schools, the 87 middle schools, and the 90 high schools located in Franklin County. Let's clap for all those teachers and educators. And this is just a snapshot. For more information, please call our Washington or district office and we can share more. This year, I have introduced legislation to help homeless veterans have the desperately needed legal services. I have also co-sponsored another bill to help former service members off the street. I have joined in with a number of bipartisan pieces of legislation to help homeless families and children who have fallen between the cracks. There are so many pieces of legislation that I could tell you for first time home buyers to give them an incentive to help them purchase their first home. I also have had the opportunity to be invited in to join many of our caucuses right here in Congress, like sharing my role with Congressman Steve Stifers as a co-chair of our Financial and Economic Literacy Caucus, co-chair of the Congressional Heart and Stroke Coalition, vice chair of the Democratic Seniors Task Force, and Deputy Vice Chair for the Congressional Voting Rights Act. But it's not about me tonight, it's about us. So another reminder, if you have a question or a comment, please press zero 
and our staff will help you or simply leave a message on Facebook. Now, many of you have been following the news and you know that the Affordable Health Care Act was voted on by our Congress and it was voted to be repealed and to be replaced with the American Health Care Act. But let me just tell you, we heard you. Because of the number of phone calls, emails, letters, and the individuals who actually came right here to our house step asked us not to consider this bill. Well, the bill was passed out. We may vote on it again, but either way, the health care bill has to go to the Senate. And the Senate, as I understand, is writing their own bill right now. Although we do not know exactly what's in that bill or what it will look like, I will not support a bill that is unwinding all the progress that the country has made since the Affordable Care Act. And let me tell you why. Because that bill has some 30 million or more Americans, people like you and I, who have a health care plan. And reducing the uninsured rate to a historic low and ensuring that individuals with pre-existing conditions will never lose coverage. This includes women, seniors, and people with disabilities. The Financial Services Committee, Republicans on that same day had a vote that they voted on the health care bill also voted on a bill called the Financial Choice. Now that's a bill that's housed in the prestigious committee that I serve on, the Financial Services Committee. Many of you have heard about the landmark Dodd-Frank Act. Well, this bill would gut it and replace it. What most of us are familiar with is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the director of that from our own very state of Ohio, Mr. Richard Cordray. This is a federal agency that has returned nearly $12 billion to almost 30 million Americans like you and I. I am hopeful that this bill will not make it to the president's desk if it is gutted. Now again, another reminder, if you have a comment or a question, please press zero and my staff will assist you or feel free to leave a comment on Facebook. And lastly, I know you've been watching all of the national TV shows and you're curious about what's going on with the FBI investigation into Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election and the potential personal political, and financial ties between our president and his campaign in Russia. Like most of you, it seems like every day or maybe even every hour, I learn something new about the Trump-Russia connections, whether it be classified or unclassified information. These are very unique times. The cent in Central Ohio and the entire nation both are watching closely, and there are many questions that need to be answered. Naming the former FBI Director Robert Mueller is a good start, a bipartisan start. Republicans and Democrats have all welcomed him, but we know still needs, there's still more that needs to be done. And just yesterday, the President released his 2018 budget a document which is very, very harmful, in my opinion, to average Americans in favor of wealthy individuals and those who can afford many of the things that people like us and families can. It is an extremely misguided document that could make life much harder for millions of Americans struggling to get ahead or even just to get by day by day. The budget cuts $193 billion from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. We call that SNAP. Some may be old as I am and remember it called food stamps. 
$7 billion from the National Institution of Health, or NIH, $10.6 billion from the Federal Education Initiative. And it eliminates proven federal programs like the Community Development Block Grant Program, the Corporation for Broadcasting, and the Legal Services Corporation, and that's just to name a few. That's another reason we're sharing this information with you tonight so you can call in and let us know how you feel about that. There's so much more I could talk about tonight, but I want to hear from you. So I'm going to open it up to our first caller. I am pleased to see that we have on the conference now more than 600 individuals in the first three minutes. Ohio State students, this is going to be an exciting evening. <laughs> so I have my chief of staff here with me, Kimberly Ross, and she is closely monitoring the calls that we try to get them all in. So we're going to go to our first caller, who is Bonnie from Columbus. Bonnie's question is, Bonnie, are you on the line? You have a question, a question about veterans, right? No, my question, I'm on the line, but I, I think I agree with the things you said. My son said, you know, you got to get involved. He said, my, I'm from a Democrat, he's from Maryland. He said, my people aren't going to support anything that Trump has, but what he's trying to put in, and I agree with what you said, are for the wealthy. And he's taken out all the programs that will really help the average person or the poor people. And I and when they this thing about who gets insurance and that kind of thing, is there any way that you guys can work with the insurance companies? Who have all the actuaries who know how much these things cost um, that could um, make them insure everybody for the same amount regardless of whether they're from a big organization. Okay, we hear you and I think first of all let me just say thank you for calling in and for listening to the first part of the conversation about what's being removed or would be removed from the Affordable Care Act as we know it now. And let me just say, we don't have a perfect anything, and but what we do know, there's been a lot of good things and maybe we need to continue to improve upon it. So I'm gonna ask Sam, is there anything you wanna add to it about the insurers or how we can make this better? Thanks so much. I mean, I think uh, the, this question hits on exactly the issue, which is, you know, prior to the Affordable Care Act, I think we probably all remember situations where we might have a, a relative or a friend who was sick uh, or older who just couldn't afford coverage because insurers would charge them thousands and thousands of dollars more than they would someone else. And that's actually what the Affordable Care Act got rid of. It made sure that you couldn't discriminate against people uh, based on a health condition that they might have or if they were older. Unfortunately, this Republican proposal would get rid of that. It would allow you to be charged more if you were older, you had a condition like asthma, anything like that. And so I think it's very important for people that care about this, that care about making sure that folks that, are, uh, that have uh, health conditions are able to get coverage, that they, they do everything they can to uh, let their representatives know uh, not to support this current bill and to make sure that what we call pre-existing condition protections stay. Uh, it's a crucial thing that millions of Americans depend on, and it's a, it's a really big step that the Affordable Care Act uh, gave us. Thank you. And thank you so much for calling in. We have another caller on the line, and now we are going to go to, it looks like, Aletha. Aletha, are you on the line? Aletha from Columbus? Aletha? Okay, we'll go to the next caller and maybe we'll circle back with her. Our... Okay, I'm, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Aletha, what's your question tonight? My question is, if they're cutting out all these programs, like a lot of programs for kids that, uh, that for the school luncheon and programs for after school and programs for the summer for the kids and stuff, and um, I would have said, and for 
I hear you. I understand. I think where you're going, we have a number of calls that are coming up in that same light. This simply asking the question, where do we go from here and what do we do? We just today received more information. And I want to share with you, you are right on track because what's happening, they're cutting $4.9 billion from education departments. When we look at health and human services, another 4.8 plus billion dollars. Housing and urban development, 4.1 billion dollars. The Justice Department, 210 million dollars. And the list goes on and on. So what we have to do is be prepared to use our voices. People have to speak up and ask what's going to happen to use your language those safety net programs. For those of you who might not know that term, it means the programs that when your children go to school and it's a lunch program, or it's the after school program, or it's the program that's in your local community programs, or your housing programs that provide services not only for our children, but for our seniors for respite care. So calling in tonight helps me. It allows me to say when I go to the floor of Congress that I heard from you and I am standing with you. You need to also express your concerns not only with me, but with other members of Congress and ask all of us, how do we replace those services? We cannot allow us to have tax reforms, which we need, but not on the backs of the least of us. We're going to go to another question, and this question is coming from Mary from Columbus, Ohio. Mary, are you on the line? I'm here. Okay. Go ahead, I'm Mary. Here. Thank you. How are you this evening? Well, thank you very much. Uh, my concern is about older people and their Medicare. And the things that's going on with the medicine. And, and let me just say to this, and, and Wendy, uh, who's in our district office, may want to add to this, but let me just say, people have to understand when you talk about Medicare and Medicaid, so if you're talking about Medicare, that's individuals out there who are 65 years of older and receive those services for medical assistance, for hospitalization, Medicaid for those who qualify financially, but also for those with disabilities. And we have uh, to make sure that we protect them and that we keep that donut or the cost down with their pharmaceuticals because one of the number one calls we get are from seniors who are asking us, how am I gonna pay for the medicine that I'm required to take? to live a quality life. Wendy, one of our experts, is there anything you'd like to add to this for Mary? Thank you, Congresswoman. I would. Um, I'm Wendy Patton, Senior Project Director with Policy Matters Ohio. We're a nonpartisan, not-for-profit research group. And we have looked closely at health care over the last five years. The new um, Yes. The rest of the country. We're just, our population is getting older faster. 
more, as we age more and more and more, we have more need for um, assisted living in nursing homes. So I feel the seniors are very much um, endangered by the American Health Care Act Republican House Plan. Thank you so much, Wendy. And lastly, let me say, this is another reason that we're streaming this live on Facebook. We're hoping that people will know that there are other constituents out there with your same concern. And we will be writing all of these concerns up. You will be able to watch it live tomorrow and the next week. And it will remind us that we need to get answers back to you. We have another caller on the line, and this caller is Frida. Frida, are you on the line? Frida? Yes, I'm on the line. Okay, go ahead, Frida, with your question, please. Okay, I have um, a few questions and a comment about the Medicaid, and I'm, I am a senior, and I know we got, we got a raise on the Social Security. Because the whole raise went towards Medicare, and I want to, and I, I think we're on the same page when it comes to Donald Trump cutting things, cutting things out for senior citizens, and um, and everything is like going away from us instead of helping us, you know, improve our quality of life. And I think this is this is just my personal opinion. Let me just say thank you and we hear you. And let me just add to your comments because this is another reason we need to hear from our constituents. I'm glad you're saying it live so other people will hear you and know that it is important for our constituents to know that President Trump's budget does make significant cuts to the Social Security Disability Program to the tune of $73 billion and some $839 billion to the Medicaid program. And, and what that does, I know we're throwing a lot of numbers at you tonight. So if you take the millions and the billions of dollars that's being cut, let me say it to you simply that that affects some 90 million people who are relying on that health care coverage. So this is another reason that I'm doing this tonight. And since you said you want a congressperson who will go to Congress and speak up on this, I'm going to ask you to stay tuned and watch when we do our updates on what's happening in Congress. And when I go to the House floor, I will be carrying your message to stand up for the people. We're going to take another call here. And on the line now, we have, uh, we have Walter from Columbus. Are, are you there, Walter? Hello. Hello. Yes, go ahead. You're quite I'm well. I'm a veteran, and I'm concerned about the veterans issue, but farther ahead of that is the CHIP program and the program to help seniors. It is insane that millionaires and billionaires are trying to get a, a tax increase cut on the backs of the poorest of the poor. So I'll stand with you in any way possible and that uh, we can get through this situation because uh, John McCain said today, dead or alive. There you go.
Rita. Well, I think, Walter, you've said it all. And for those who were listening to Walter, he covered it all when he said the CHIP program, that's the Children's Hospitalization Insurance Program, Children's Health Insurance Program. So from our youngest to our seniors. And thank you, Walter, because that's what we're fighting for. And John McCain, uh, our Republican senator in Congress, so this is not a partisan thing. It's people who are standing up for our children and our seniors. Okay, we have another caller uh, on the line, and we're going to go to a caller from Hilliard, and that caller is Jenny. Jennifer. Jennifer, are you on the line? Yes, I am. So, um, my question is concerning women's health. So, um, I have a daughter who's Thank you so much. And in our audience tonight, we have actually almost a dozen women who are sitting with us tonight. And many of them, I'm sure, are 26 and under, and they're still on their parents' insurance. And they certainly want to be health, healthy and should have the right to express what they want for their health care. Let me just add to your comment and say the effects on premiums for out-of-pocket expenses. Out-of-pocket expenses for things like maternity care, mental health care, substance abuse care could increase by thousands of dollars in a given year. So another reason that we're asking members of Congress to join me and take a critical look at what's included and more importantly, What's being taken away? And women's health care is one of those things. It also reduces the funding for child care. And while that responsibility does not solely lie for women, but if you look at the statistics with the number of single moms that are female and the number of working women, that number is well over 50% now, somewhere around 60%. And I just have an article here that says it reduces the funding for child care development with the child care development block grant by $95 million. So when you look at the number of child care subsidies nationwide for those who fall in a lower income bracket, this would be devastating to the programs and to women. So we want women to continue to call in. Uh, certainly for those who follow me, you've heard me say many of times, when women succeed, America succeeds. And let me tell you what that really means. It's not just about women, because when women succeed, families succeed. So it's about helping women, helping our children, and you help men as well. We're going to go to another caller. And we have someone from Upper Arlington on the phone. Lily, are you there from Upper Arlington? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead with your question. Yes, um, I have pre existing Obamacare health care. And the first month was 92 credit. I paid $156 premium. The second month and to the present day, I the credits went up to 156 credit. Because what you're telling me is you went from a hundred and fifty two dollars to four hundred yes. plus dollars. Sam, do you want to take a, a shot at Sam or Wendy? Do you want to take a, a a stab at that? And then I'm going to address that as well. Sure. 
Um, so I think obviously premiums are a really important thing. Uh, it's a big cost for a lot of families. Uh, one thing I would suggest is uh, what we're seeing with the Republican health care bill is going in the wrong direction. Um, first of all, millions and millions of people will just lose their coverage altogether. But also, you'll see premiums skyrocket. Um, for example, if you have a pre-existing condition, and, and remember insurers consider things like pregnancy a pre-existing condition, for something like that, you could pay $17,000 more. So this bill is really taking us in the wrong direction. I think there are certainly things that can and should be done to try and lower people's premiums, but stripping health care away from millions and millions of Americans to give a large tax cut to millionaires mm -hmm. doesn't, really, uh, doesn't really get us anywhere on premium costs. Wendy, would you like to make a comment on that before I close it out? Thank you, Congresswoman. I think that um, many families struggle with the cost of health care, and it sounds really like you're struggling with the cost of health care. And I'm sorry to hear about the pre existing condition. Um, as much as we're struggling to stabilize insurance markets under the existing system, what we see coming down the road in the new plan is is possibly worse. What um, I think is sometimes called deregulation, I would call protection. And so some of the protections we have under the existing Affordable Health Care Act for pre-existing conditions could prove to be your firewall against higher costs and also against losing health coverage altogether. That's what you should be awake at night about this system. It's a uh, proposal, but I'm sorry to hear about your pre-existing condition, and we have to be vigilant about trying to make sure that people are getting the health care they need without financial hardship, and the Congresswoman is working hard to make that happen for you. And, and let me just add that I understand it because most people don't realize as a member of Congress, we had to go into the affordable care plan just like you. And for people in the age bracket of 50 to well over into their 60s, under the existing, our premiums could go as high as one to three times higher. Sounds like your, yours was in that category like mine was. But in the proposed health care plan under President Trump's plan, it goes one to five times higher. And for those with pre-existing conditions like you and like myself, here's what's very unfortunate about that. It would put you into a high risk pool because remember, those with pre-existing conditions with this uh, plan that uh, you had a cold and it went into pneumonia or the fact that you gave birth to a child is a pre-existing condition. We need to stand up and use our voices against that. Thank you. We're going to go to another caller. And this caller is from Worthington and I believe it's uh, Karen. Karen, are you on the line? And let me just say, as Karen is getting on the line, we have had more than 3,300 people to join us on the conference call within the first 15 minutes of the call. We have had a little less than 20,000 messages left on the call, and we still have hundreds of hundreds of people on the call, and we have 29 people on the waiting list. So I'm going to have to move a little faster here with the calls. Remember, if you have a question, please press zero and my staff will assist you or feel free to leave a comment on Facebook. Okay, Karen, are you there? Yes, I am. Go ahead, please. Yeah, um, good evening, Representative Beatty. Thank I'm you. one of those people who had to work and borrow to go to school. And I, of course, like a lot of Americans, racked up a significant amount of debt. Uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Trump in his proposed budget uh, this year uh, is uh, looking to end is the uh, public student loan forgiveness program. That seems to be something that he wants to end, get rid of entirely. Now, I mean, I pay my loan faithfully, but it's the second highest cost that I have. So I want to know, uh, first off, you know, what your awareness of, is of his 
Well, you know, I wish I could have better news tonight, but as we have been reviewing it, education is a high priority on my list, so I've been asking my uh, staff to put a critical eye on the budget and how it relates not only to health care, not only to jobs and the economy, but education is huge. Like you, uh, I went to state-supported schools and I worked and I had assistance. Well, I can tell you here under his program cuts, which we received, let me just share a little with you directly from this. Funding for college work-study programs would be cut in half. Public service loan forgiveness, like what you were talking about, would end in hundreds of millions of dollars that public schools could use from everything from coursework to mental health and other services would vanish under a Trump administration plan with a cut of $10.6 billion from federal and educational initiatives. The spending proposal would maintain funding for some of the Pell grants for students in financial need, but it would eliminate more than $700 million in the Perkins loans for disadvantaged students. So nearly half of the work-study programs that help students work their way through college like you and me and millions of other students would be cut by $490 million. That's the first step towards ending subsidized loans for which the government pays interest while borrowers in school and it, it would basically end the loan forgiveness program. So I think one of the things that we're asking individuals to do is use your voice. You know, contact the U.S. Secretary of Education. And an earlier caller talked about the appointees, the people who were appointed to some of these cabinet positions. We have to make sure that they understand that we're going to speak up and speak out. And that's just a fact. You know, you have to let people know that this is affecting your lives. Lives like the people who are on the call tonight, regular families and hardworking Americans. We need to hear from you. Don't just call your representatives. Call your senators, call others, call those who are on the education committee and let them know that this is devastating to you and to your families. And, and let me just say to this, there are Democrats and Republicans who feel the same way about many of the health care issues since we've had so many callers on health care. When we took that last vote, let me remind you, it was 213 to 217. So very close. So that means there are a lot of us listening to you, Democrats and Republicans. Okay, we're going to go to another caller. We have a caller from Columbus by the name of Alan. Alan, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, Alan, go ahead with, with your call. Yeah. With your question, so, uh, I'm sorry. I, I really have two concerns, really. Both of them concerning what you were sort of just touching on with, with education expense. Um, I'm a little concerned how the price of higher education, like specifically colleges, is just increasing drastically to the point where students have to take out so many loans that almost like higher education is becoming unattainable. But even like, um, specifically like uh, secondary schools, like medical schools and things, mm -hmm. students come out of medical school with like $400,000 of debt to the point where it's almost becoming impossible to even do this. So I, I think really uh, my question is, what can we do about this kind of stuff? Uh, what can be done? Because I'm a little worried about the concern of the direction that the current administration is moving towards. Well, one of the things, and let me just say first, thank you for your call, and you're absolutely right about some of the, the medical ex expenses, and I'll use that because you uh, use that as your example. One of the things that's hurting us drastically with that is people are no longer wanting to go into general medicine. You know, when I grew up, you had the general practitioners, or we called them the family doctors that you could go to. Part of the reason is there's a great interest for that, but the salaries are greater in the specialty areas. 
So people are wanting to uh, go into neurology to be a neurosurgeon, or they're going into the specialty areas versus the general practitioners because they're feeling that they won't make enough money to pay back the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that hurts us for the individuals that just want to go in uh, to see their family doctor. So one of the things we have to do is to make sure that we work with those institutions of higher education to make sure that we keep those costs down. At some point, we're going to have to talk about the continue to talk about the putting a cap on some of those tuitions, but also doing what some of our Ohio universities, I have to give them a plug. Many of them have not raised their tuition. And we've been able to make sure that we've had some fixed costs on the interest rates that they could be charged for it. But I am going to say to you, it is a continuing problem that we are working with with our universities. Hopefully that helped. Uh, Alan, was that the end of, of your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. And we'll go to another caller uh, on the line. And... We have our first Facebook question. Uh, we have Maggie, and Maggie said, can we discuss student loan repayment? I've heard, um, and so Maggie, thank you first from that question. And, and let me just say, I've heard from a number of constituents uh, since I've been here in Congress regarding the student loan repayment. Uh, a few of the things that uh, I'm concerned with, that you're, this is her question, that she's concerned with in the president's budget request is the elimination of more than $700 million in the Perkins loan, which is for disadvantaged uh, students. Nearly half of the work-study programs that help students work their way through school, cutting that $400 million dollars takes the first step towards cutting out all of the subsidized programs. So let me say back to you, Maggie, that one of the incorporate that these questions came from strong and courageous constituents like you to hold me accountable. Uh, I've co-sponsored the Student Loan Refinancing Act, which is H.R. 1614, which would actually authorize borrowers of federal student loans to refinance their loans more than once at any time that's uh, left on the loan so they can take care of, of actually getting a lower interest rate uh, when we have a, during times when we have a better uh, economic stability in our country. But look for me uh, to issue a public statement on making sure that we do not support taking away the student loans. Uh, I might call that a Maggie piece of legislation. Thank you, Maggie, so much for calling in. Uh, do we have another caller on the line? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we're going to go to Dorothy. Dorothy from the Hilltop. Dorothy, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Okay, Dorothy, go ahead. Bye. And the first one is, how do we combat this horrible plan? Both plans are bad. I don't know which one's the worst. Mm -hmm. um, but we're dealing with the, the, the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like everything that he's done has been on the back of the poor. Everything that he deducted was off of us. And what do we do to combat this? Isn't there something we can do? Isn't there someplace we could go? Is there someplace we could call? to combat this, to let him know, yes, we care. Uh, we are the people. We exactly. are the people. It's, it's for the people, by the people. And we are the people, and we're the ones getting stomped down. Yes. He's breaking our backs. Well, let me just say this. And many constituents out there are doing this, so I would invite you to join those who are speaking out, whether it is writing letters whether it is having a day that we're going to designate, uh, stop cutting our services on the backs of regular families, and that we have a day that we call in. Because here's one of the things. We need to hear from you. 
That's the reason I'm doing this Teletown Hall. That's the reason why I do a State of the District live in person with hundreds of individuals, because as a member of Congress, I believe we have an obligation to hear from you. I don't always hear from constituents that agree or like the vote, but I have an obligation to entertain those questions and comments like we're doing tonight. And let me tell you why I appreciate this call and your comment, because it's not only Democrats, and I'm going to say this repeatedly, there are Republicans who have joined with Democrats to make sure that President Trump's budget does not become a reality. And I think you have to hold all of us accountable because we took an oath to serve the people. Taking away these services is not serving the people. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're going to take another caller. At this time, we have uh, William from Columbus. William, are you on the line? Yes, I am on the line. Thank you for uh, taking my question. You're welcome. Okay, well, let, let me just uh, say I voted against this. You're, you're right when it was in Congress because uh, what it would do for those, and, and I'm trying not to get in the weeds with, with uh, this for the audience, but let me just say thank you because it would require the administration to weigh the potential cost of any new, uh, let's say, significant regulation and then give Congress the power to, to uh, override it or to vote down any uh, new rule with large economic Im impacts uh, set at, I believe it's $100 million of more. Uh, it was a partisan bill uh, taking issue with the President Obama administration trying to limit the rulemaking uh, authority. And I have opposed it each year in, in Congress. But thank you so much for bringing that to our attention and uh, allowing me to try to define that and explain that. Uh, okay, we have another caller on the line, Julie. Uh, I'm going to take the call from Julie. Julie, are from Westerville, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Julie, from Westerville. Well, well, let me just say, um, I can tell you that we have not forgotten about uh, gun violence and what we need to continue to do. Uh, many of you may be reminded of how we actually sat on the House floor uh, to do a sit-in. Well, that sit-in was all around having a better gun law so we could prevent some of the, the gun violence. Uh, we sat there for 26 and a half hours, and I'm very proud to say that I was part of that committee with John Lewis and others who organized that. This is a very serious issue. It's a very dangerous issue. We're losing too many lives, and I want to say thanks to all those programs out there, and Julie, to people like you and other moms who are ab advocating uh, for us to have better laws. I'm going to tell you one person I think everybody should call, and that is Speaker Ryan. He holds the control over whether something comes to the floor or whether it's something that goes to a committee. And we need to be more engaged with this. We've not forgotten all the work that our communities across the United States are doing. Uh, thank you uh, so much for that uh, call. Uh, 
Okay, so we have another call uh, on the line. We have someone from Galloway, Patricia from Galloway. Patricia, are you there? I'm here. Okay, go ahead with your question, please. Okay, let me make it easy for you. You're uh, one of our constituents. Uh, we are easy. Uh, we can easily remedy that. Uh, you can also call my office, and they will give it to you. You can call 614-220-0003, and they will assist okay. you. Or you can go to www.house.gov. And that will bring up the numbers, whether it's Speaker Ryan or any other uh, member of Congress you want to contact. www.house.gov. G O V. Okay. Um, thank you. And I do get your email newsletter. Thank you. Uh, my team is applauding that you said that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your call, and we will continue to serve you. Uh, we're going to go to Facebook. Uh, we have several people on Facebook. Uh, we have someone named Betty on Facebook, and Betty said, we need to have a budget that cuts evenly across all programs, and the question is, Congresswoman, do you agree? Uh, I could just simply answer that by saying three letters, Y-E-S. Yes, it should be evenly across the board. It should not be something that is balanced on the backs of uh, folks like you and I, the students from The Ohio State University's program that's here with us tonight. Congress has actually passed these types of budget, and it's known as the sequester. And I'm opposed to these types of budget cuts that, if it's not balanced, to take the safety nets and the services that we need away is not something that I'm going to support. Because I believe that Congress has an obligation to review all of the federal programs and determine where the cuts make sense and what we should continue for the best results for all Americans not the top percent, not for the wealthy. And I think we can do that. You're going to hear some people disagree with me tonight because they're going to say we have to have tax reform. We have to do this. And they're absolutely right. No one's going to argue with you that we don't need to do that. We don't need to do it on the backs of those who are regular working families and those who are the least of us. Thank you for that uh, Facebook. I think we are going to go to another caller, and then we have another Facebook caller we're going to go to. Right now, we're going to Christine from Columbus. Hello. Yes, Christine. Hello. Christine, are you there? I, I have this big Thank screen you so if you're looking at me. Thank you.
Well, let me say, I think we have to do what we're doing tonight. I think we have to continue to pose the question to all members of Congress, to listen to their constituents, to have town hall meetings, to go live, and, and we have to continue to challenge us. So I can say to you tonight, uh, part of the question I saw on the screen was, well, I support these cuts. And I can tell you unequivocally that I'm not going to support or vote for cuts that hurts. Hurts college students, hurts our seniors, hurts, I would say, from infancy to life. So I'm going to stand with you, and I'm not going to support those cuts. Thank you for your call. We have another call on the line, and it is... Shaba, we have a call, Shaba from Columbus. Are you there, Shaba? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Go ahead with your question, please. Okay, so I don't want to minimize the other issues um, as far as Medicaid, Medicare, and veteran issues. However, the one, the one issue that I'm not hearing being discussed in this political climate is um, the working poor. And I was reading over the um, poverty report, um, which showed that in Columbus that there was 13.8% of um, persons who are considered to be poverty stricken, which is really close, uh, almost parallel to a national poverty um, level. And so I was wondering, um, being a working poor myself, I went to college, did everything everybody said to do that was right, go to school, get your degree. Um, get a good job, and you live this fabulous life. Well, I live in a two-bedroom townhouse with my kids, um, and I work two jobs with a college degree, and I'm considered below the poverty level, um, struggling just to make ends meet. Um, so I guess I'm wondering is, one, how do we um, approach this issue um, as a solve of the problem? Two, who's working on that? And three, how do I become the face and the voice um, to advocate for women, um, fathers, parents, families like myself who are just struggling to keep their head above water um, when we seem to be left out of politics. We're always talking about upper class, um, the rich or the poor. What about the people that are in the middle who are breaking our backs every day who have to choose between staying home with a sick child or taking them to the doctor and going to work because we don't know if we don't go to work, we're not going to have any work for our kids to say. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to figure out how to get involved and be a better voice versus just making calls to Congress people because that, that, that's kind of frustrating to me. Sure. Um, I want to be the voice. I want to solve this problem and figure out who's working to address this problem. Um, as far as these statistics, I have a, a feeling that um, it's a little higher than that 14.8%. Well, well, you've given us a, a lot, so let me start with that your engagement tonight is a good start. And, and I understand, you know, calling uh, congressional offices may not seem like a lot, but let me just tell you it is. Most of our legislation that's either passed or stopped comes because someone like you continued to call in. Someone like you continue to get other people to support you, to follow you, and then I'm going to say you start a movement. And that's what gets our attention around here. When you have uh, bills and they're named after someone, and if you're hearing this, these are our bells that ring all day telling us when it's time to end uh, a floor vote or start. So, so let me say... Continue to be engaged. Sometimes it starts in your neighborhood. Sometimes it starts in some of the workforce uh, development programs in the community. 
but let me tell you, you are right. I serve on one of our poverty task force, and it is probably one of the most frustrating and heart-throbbing committees that I serve on, because you're right. While the numbers and the percentages should be decreasing, they're increasing. The number of people who fall through the crack. But think about it. Those are some of the people who also receive Social Security and receive Medicaid. Uh, there are some of the individuals that are trying to go through an academic or educational program or a workforce development program, like in our community colleges. Today, I was in a program where we had college presidents, two-year and four-year, and they were talking about providing workforce development uh, in my district, it was from the Columbus State Community College and what they were doing to help prevent those from falling through the cracks. In Congress, we have legislation that we've been working on. We have one of our members who's in leadership, Congressman James Clyburn from South Carolina. He has a proposal that would work across this country with a plan that he calls the 10 20 30 plan, where we would actually take 10% of the funds we have in 20% of the counties who fall in that poverty uh, position that you're talking about for those who are 30% of the poverty, of the medium income. And so it would help those individuals who probably would fall through the cracks. Now, it's, it's very complicated, but if we could get it passed, we've actually, members of our caucus, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, we actually met with Speaker Ryan and to get him to make a commitment to us that we would pass legislation like this and it's targeted for those who are the working poor or those who don't make enough and would fall through the cracks. But let me just tell you, if we don't stand up and fight for the things that the callers have been talking about, those who might be just on the other side of falling through the crack, you take away their health insurance. You take away the dollars that will help them in their communities for workforce development or for housing or for improvement of skills. That crack's going to get wider and more people are going to fall in it. So tonight you've taken a first step. And while I know it's frustrating because it's frustrating for me sometimes, I'm going to ask you, because you have a strong voice, you have a voice of commitment, to continue to do what you're doing and call into my district office and we will be able to give you some organizations that you can get engaged in that work to also give you information about more programs and how you can stay involved. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have another caller on the line, and we have uh, Patricia on the line. Patricia, are you there? Good evening, Congresswoman uh, Beatty. Thank you so much for setting up this uh, terrorist conference. My question is, what are Democrats doing to be successful in the 2018 election? The reason that I'm asking is that health care and the budget are, are vitally important. I realize that, but there's so many other issues that the Republicans seem to be blocking or just flat out hurting us, and I think the Democrats need to have more control over the issues that we can address. Well, l let me just say, uh, part of that question, uh, I can give you a clear answer, and, and that's, I think we have to do a better job on the issues. We have to continue to work hard to protect those individuals out there, whether it's their health care, whether it's their education, whether it's their communities. Um, part of that might be a political answer that I couldn't give you on this call, but let me just say we hear you. And I think what I can say to you is we have to get people registered to vote. And we have to make sure that people actually vote because voting is your only voice to help you make changes. So whether it's a concern that you have about healthcare education or how we get back into the majority, I want you to know that we are fighting every day 
to make sure that what Republican leadership has hidden from the American people that we expose. Town halls do that. There are thousands of people who are on this call now and one person wrote in and said, I don't have a question, but I'm learning new information. And let me just tell you, information is powerful. So the more information we can give you, it helps us get engaged in the upcoming election. Uh, we need to get women engaged in the process. We have a large number of women now who are advocating, whether it's paid leave, whether it's making sure that you have equal pay for equal work. We need to make sure that we use our voices. I mean, I've participated in some of the marches that went across this country and it worked. It changed what we were doing. That's how we get people elected. We start movements. We need to start talking in sound bites, giving people hope, letting them know if they get engaged that there's opportunities to turn around some of the things that we don't like. Thank you for that call. Uh, we have another call, and uh, Sharon is on the line. Sharon, are you there? Yes, thank you, Congresswoman Beatty. Uh, I'm a 63-year-old widow, senior citizen, and is a frontal Republican. Uh, I'm paying $12,500 a year in premium for my health care. And if that is going to be five times that rate, it would put me at $62,500, and I would be forced to be um, uh, uninsured. Um, my, my question to you is, um, concerning the pharmaceutical companies and uh, the doctors and hospitals, but especially the pharmaceutical companies, they have overridden the airways with their commercials, mm -hmm. and trillions of dollars a year advertising. Is there some way Congress can regulate, especially these pharmaceutical companies, ban them from advertising on television like uh, tobacco and uh, alcohol has been banned it, and uh, those trillions of dollars would very quickly bring down the cost of prescription medication, and also along the same lines, um, somehow cap these um, out of control charges that hospitals and doctors are uh, putting on uh, not only senior citizens but everybody else. Well, l let me first say thank you for your call, and I certainly understand that because we've had a number of people who have called in and said, I don't need to say it, but make sure that you stand up, that we do something about this health care. And while we don't have the perfect uh, health care system now, the Affordable Care Act did do a number of great things. What we're seeing now is with the new health care plan from... Uh, President Trump's administration and what he's putting before us and our Republican colleagues, it's going to do, unfortunately, many of those things that you're concerned about. So we have to continue to advocate. Calling in tonight is a start because what happens when you're a member of Congress, it allows me to go with more than just me saying it. I'm going to be able to go to the House floor. I'm going to be able to go to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and tell them tonight we went live on Facebook and I'm looking at the screen that we had 20 some thousand people in the first 15 minutes and we had people that stayed on this call for an hour and a half trying to get on to ask their questions and 85 to 90 percent of those questions are in the healthcare arena just like the question you asked. Wendy, is there anything you would like to add to that or Sam uh, to help her with this? And I'm calling on them because we have to recognize we have experts in this nation that study and review this every day. And I believe it's going to take all of us. It's going to take the students who are here tonight for them to understand and hear your concerns and to go back and do research. It's going to take the experts. Wendy or Sam, uh, as we're getting ready to wrap up, anything you would like to add? Because this is a very pertinent question. So I, I just uh, to echo some of what you're saying. Obviously, prescription drug costs are a very important issue. 
for millions of Americans, and I think uh, there are certainly steps to be taken in the right direction. Unfortunately, what we're seeing, though, is a step in the wrong direction, one in which people are going to see their costs go up, including, uh, in some cases, perhaps uh, insurance uh, plans that don't even cover prescription drugs. And I guess I would say, if you look at sort of the winners from this bill, there aren't very many, this being the Republican bill. Millions and millions of Americans would lose their coverage, but one of the things that would happen is pharmaceutical companies would actually get a tax break. So instead of seeing your pharmaceutical costs go down, they would go up, and in exchange, drug companies would end up pocketing more money. I, I think that's sort of a, a problem with this bill in which you know, ordinary people are hurt, um, and millionaires, uh, insurance companies, and, and drug manufacturers are getting you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in tax cuts. Thank you. And thank you for that call. We're getting ready to wrap up. I know we have a lot of other calls on Facebook. So I'm going to say for those who wanted to know what we are doing about uh, housing and what we are doing about our seniors, let me just tell you that is something very dear to my heart. I serve on the financial services and housing in HUD comes under that. And you can rest assured, every day I am fighting to make sure that we maintain HUD dollars in Section 8 and that we maintain dollars for our seniors. Uh, you can call our office at 614-220-0003 for more information. We have another uh, caller on the line, Monique. Monique, are you there? I think this is probably going to be our last call. So, Monique, let's hear from you. Well, let me explain this. As, as you know, on the House side where I serve, there are 435 uh, members of Congress. And, and that number fluctuates because we've had people uh, to get presidential appointments and to step down. So where we are today with that, if that budget would come to the floor, we would need 216 of us on our side to defeat that budget. Uh, you would need 216, obviously, to pass that budget. Uh, we don't have a target date that I can tell you now uh, that is gonna actually come to the floor. That's controlled by the majority party. Uh, in the ideal world, it would go into committee. We have a committee that would hear, hold hearings, hear it, review it. We have the rules committee. The speaker makes the determination and the chairperson of those committees. Once it goes through that uh, procedure and it comes to the House floor and we have usually an, an hour or whatever the speaker and the chairman determines for debate uh, from both sides of the aisle on that bill, immediately following that debate, the members of Congress enter the House floor and we vote with an electronic card. And immediately, as the vote is called within the time allotted, that could be a 15-minute vote, and we would put our cards in and you would have the results immediately. And, and thank you, Monique, for that call because it's so important for us to know and understand the process. Again, if you have questions, you can feel free to call my district office or my Washington call office uh, right here. Uh, let me just say again uh, to the students from The Ohio State University, thank you for joining us. Uh, for, and, and they stay here with us. We have one of my very own uh, staff members on my legislative team sitting with them. <laughs> Uh, and my whole team is here, and let me say to them, thank you, but more importantly, to the constituents of the 3rd Congressional District and to anyone who's not from the 3rd Congressional District. I am here to serve you. I've had fun with this. I hope you've enjoyed it, and we will continue to serve you. 
Just as a reminder, as we close out, feel free to call my district office at 614-220-0003, or feel free to call my Washington office where we are tonight, 202-225-4324. I'm very pleased with tonight. We've had fun with it. As you can see, I have lots of facts we want you to know about our By the Numbers. I also have tons of questions that my staff has been answering for those you didn't hear from, but we've been calling people back and trying to answer all of their questions. Uh, those who are on the line can obviously leave their questions while we're going off of Facebook Live. We will continue to answer those questions or to take those questions for anyone who is on the line with a question. And that's because we're here to serve. And just in case you didn't know, I am Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, and I approve tonight's message. Thank you.